Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our second presentation of how do I test all this stuff with Adam Wickard. So please welcome Adam Wickard. Thanks. I was trying to uh, trying to share my screen here. I want to talk about how to test all this stuff. There's a lot of stuff around that we end up needing to deal with and and test. Um, testing is pretty foundational. It's a big part of of what we have to do. If you think about it, that's um, a lot of what Neil's session was kind of about uh, on Nudge too. He's talking about different ways to uh, to deploy the. The, the notifications itself and and those things are all uh, all pretty positive. Uh, but I think a big part of it too is thinking about how you might want to test in a separate system. So he's using a, a virtual machine in that. Thought I'd uh, give ourselves a, a good start here with um, a quote from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I never could quite get the hang of Thursdays, which I think uh, really encapsulates my uh, my feelings on uh, on Thursdays, I guess. So, uh, my name's Adam. I've uh, I've presented at Mac Admins a few times before here, and last year I did a presentation with Virtual JNUC. Um, pretty uh, pretty active on the Mac Admin Slack, and you'll probably find me on there if you have any questions. Um, have a blog and a GitHub with some stuff that I like to share. I'll have a post with uh, some slides and some links uh, up later today. And uh, this is something I wanted to start by saying is that 100% uh, of IT admins have a testing environment, but some people are lucky enough to have a separate production environment. A little bit of a joke, but if you don't have a separate testing environment or a method to stage things before sending things uh, out widely, you're sort of always in that that testing environment. You're always testing things out, which gives you a little bit of risk. So first we're going to talk about some management tools. Let's say there's a new tool out you want to try. Maybe you're dipping your feet into the Mac admin waters for the first time and you want to try some open source tools, or maybe you're working someplace that didn't have a management setup for their Macs and you're trying to come in and wrangle them. So those are all reasons you might want to try and test a new tool. You might want to try an open source tool like Monkey to deliver packages, but you'll need to set up a few pieces to make that work for you. Maybe there's a new feature in a tool that you're already using. Uh, the latest build might have something different than what you're currently working with. Or maybe an existing vendor has a new tool that you're considering adding to your contract. Think things like Jamf Connector, Jamf Protect that exist, uh, that are great tools to play with, uh, but you need to try it first. So there's a couple of ways that you might be able to do it. You want to learn or consider selling your management on it. A lot of things might offer a free trial which is a good way to start. Some of it might be time limited or limited to a number of licenses or limited on what features you can access. Some free open source software will have some great community support. There'll be blog posts, easy to find tutorials, and really great stuff like that to get you started when it comes to testing something that you haven't done before. A really great tool to think about testing, especially if you're starting, is Two Canoes MDS. Uh, MDS has some really powerful and, and useful stuff built into it, and it allows you to do a huge variety of things. And if you're just starting, you've got tools like Monkey, which is available for managing software installation. You can have it do things like patching by automatically updating what's already there. You can automate even in the uploading and uh, uh, and checking versions uh, with a tool like Auto Package, which we'll talk about a little bit later. It has Monkey Report, which can give you a lot of information on your fleet. But you've also got Micro MDM, which is a an open source version of the MDM framework. And when you have that as a base, you are able to test some of those things even without going into uh, paying for a version of an MDM or without having to spin up your own version of it because it's included here. 
or without having to start a trial where you're in a, a limited version or you may have to have a time limited or resource limited um, version. I know that uh, this particularly has had a lot of uh, a lot of interest lately. Um, Tim from Duke News has presented about this latest build in a few different places, um, but it's an amazing tool that you can use for free. It lets you easily set up and play with a lot of popular tools and get experience with them. And it also lets you easily, well, I guess this was the original, the original point was it lets, it lets you easily refresh a machine uh, using Apple's new supported methods instead of some of the old, what they call gold master imaging. So we'll think about testing Mac OS. It's something that we all need to do, and there's a lot of options. Some of them are easier than others, and there's pros and cons to different methods. So we have to test for all kinds of different reasons. We might be testing a beta for a new major release or a new minor release. We might be testing how a delay works being set by a profile, which was something we were talking about back with that nudge session too. We might be testing software compatibility or we might be testing how to deploy and install updates. There's a lot of pieces that you have to test. You might have to test on multiple versions of the operating system. You might have to test a bunch of different use cases in order to make sure that you're actually going to serve your users uh, the best way that you can. So we've got a lot of options. You can start with a virtual machine. Um, you can do it locally or with a bare metal hypervisor like ESXi. We can use physical machines, and there's a few options on how we can manage that too. We can use the start OS install command to erase and install. We can use an APFS snapshot to roll back to a unenrolled system, or we can create a secondary install on another volume. Or on a new M1 device, you can use the DFU, which is Device Firmware Update. And it's very similar to what you do on iOS and iPad OS devices to reinstall the OS fairly quickly. There's some pros and cons, of course, like everything else. For a locally installed system, you can use software that's as cheap as free, like VirtualBox or the latest version of the VMware Fusion Player which is free for personal use and no longer requires the conversion of an, uh, an installer to an ISO to install Mac OS. You can roll back some snapshots, which is a really useful thing. There are some cons. It takes some disk space and resources. You may reduce the performance of your system while running. And currently we have a lack of support on M1 devices for Mac OS guests. And the main con is that it doesn't fully replicate the hardware experience. One of the things that you really will have to think about is if you're deploying like a wireless network profile. A wireless network profile is not going to uh, be able to be tested without the physical network hardware. But we can do a, a little bit of a, a check here and see how this works and it's pretty simple. I've sped this up a little bit because if you've ever done it yourself, it takes a while. The installer now works uh, in this version of, uh, of the VMware Fusion Player to drag and drop and install Mac OS app and then it'll boot to the installer and then you can, uh, you can jump into the install right there and watch it go obviously not 20 times as fast. Um, if you do want to convert a version of the install Mac OS app, you can do that with a couple of different scripts that will convert to an ISO, but it is kind of a great feature in here. I will say in some of my testing, it works really well on some OSs, uh, and that installer seems to give me some issues when I'm trying to, uh, that conversion at least, gives me some issues when I'm trying to make a El Capitan or a Sierra virtual machine. This does take a little while because you have to install in real time. And there's a tool that existed, but uh, is no longer particularly uh, useful because of some changes with Big Sur called vFuse, which allowed you to utilize Auto DMG, which is another tool that doesn't really work because of some changes uh, in Big Sur. But that would let you create what was essentially a never booted OS. 
So it was installing just to a DMG that you could restore. If you are trying to test things on older OSs, especially if you're looking at how to migrate things from older stuff, if you're in education, you may still have a lot of machines that are running older versions. Um, these tools are still useful and they still work. You just have to be aware of those limitations that things don't necessarily work on the latest version, especially when we're talking about, you know, the next version is likely coming out uh, or being announced next week. There's a few uh, a few steps here that um, that are pretty useful that uh, actually I've seen a few different times mentioned, but once the install is complete, you can basically stop the uh, stop the system, uh, the virtual machine here at the uh, the country select screen and shut it down. And then we can go to the next the next piece here. And you can right click on your virtual machine. You can hit snapshots. Then you can click right on the current state and build yourself a fresh install snapshot. You can edit the hardware model and serial number to the VM uh, for automated device enrollment. And this is a pretty useful thing when you're trying to test either the migration to or any changes to your automated enrollment uh, workflow. So you give it a real serial number, which could be from your real machine. It could be from a machine that uh, is in your testing fleet that you're not currently using. And you can go ahead and click open config file in editor, which I believe you have to press option when you're right clicking there for it to show up and once this pops up you can add the couple of the couple of lines on the bottom there the hardware model and the serial number and once those things exist and you can edit and save it you'll be able to run that installer from that fresh freshly installed um, snapshot that you made and each time you try that you'll be able to replicate with very little time uh, invested, replicate that experience. So the next thing is to talk about a bare metal hypervisor. Um, the bare metal hypervisor is called a type two hypervisor, which runs without its own host OS to create what they call the guest machines. And this allows for some more management and allows for some different um, some different configurations. If you have something like a spare Mac mini um, from 2014 or older, uh, it's a great use for a fairly inexpensive machine so you can test systems and have multiple OSs uh, sort of at the ready. Uh, VMware's uh, ESXi hypervisor is free to use, but there's a bit of a learning curve to set it up. If you have Fusion Pro, there's some management that can be done through that application, which may make things easier. If we're talking about some of the positives, it can be really quick to spin up virtual machines, very similarly to creating that um, never booted image. We can do that same sort of thing right here on an ESXi box without having to physically be in front of it each time we are working on that. Um, and that can save you some time. It can be as cheap as free. Again, ESXi is, is not a paid product, although you can integrate it with a paid version of vSphere. And there are some cons, of course. It requires some dedicated Mac hardware that would be completely separate from your existing system. There is a bit of a learning curve. And again, we can't fully replicate the hardware experience. Um, and we're looking at some other things here where there are some, some potential issues where machines with a T2 chip in some ways can support in beta ESXi, but they have some trade-offs you can potentially use it but with the internal storage only or you can potentially use it with no internal storage and use a thunderbolt or usb enclosure for an external drive for your storage um, but because that's still very much in a testing phase it's not the most um, reliable and, and and foolproof thing to do right now and as mentioned before the new Apple Silicon chips, the M1, um, don't currently support this, and we don't know if that ever will. But if we go into looking at ESXi, 
it's fairly simple. You can start jumping into it. Um, the again to talk about the the type hypervisor you're talking about type one runs directly on the system and the virtual machine set up before is the type two which runs on a host operating system um, you install it in this pretty basic looking uh, os and then set up a few settings and you'll log into the web interface to do most of your management this is a screenshot from my uh, personal system here which um, i do not have a mac one for my home, but I have a Mac one at work that does my, my testing there. But my home system includes a bunch of uh, virtual machines for different versions of Ubuntu, different tools. One of the cool things that um, VMware offers is a, is a membership into a group called the VMware User Group. And that includes under a cost of $200 a year. Um, full evaluation licenses for most products from VMware. And this is certainly something that if your company supports, you could potentially do from professional development funds, but it can help you learn vSphere and manage um, and manage virtual machines at a, a bigger scale. Um, and of course, you can do the management of the ESXi hosts through Fusion Pro, which is the, the paid version. And if you have Fusion Pro, you can basically install your your Mac OS VMs right from that same app, but directly to the ESXi hardware, and you can remote right into them and use that GUI instead of having to do it through the, the web interface. Um, but you can certainly install Ubuntu VMs if you were going to test things like running your own version of a, of a monkey server. You can download appliances with pre-built VMs, which is a really useful thing to have just in general. Uh, one of the tools that I found um, in education that ended up being very useful is a remote broker service called Guacamole. And in conjunction with another tool that we're using, um, it, Sassafras, I think they've renamed it Allsite. It allows us to have machines remotely available for students that can use maybe specialized software or lab systems that they wouldn't be able to access because they weren't on campus. Uh, as mentioned before, uh, vFuse was a really good tool that you could use right with this here. I actually had some scripts to erase and recreate never booted v, uh, VMs, but now we're looking at uh, sort of different workflows when we're jumping into Big Sur. I think that uh, the next part here to talk about is gonna be our physical devices. And the physical device is probably the best way, uh, but not everyone has a separate device for testing. Luckily, there are some ways to work with a single device, including using a separate Mac OS install on a different APFS value. And physical devices can replicate an actual experience. That's the biggest pro. And there's cons. It can be time consuming. You may need a, a larger drive, a separate device. You may need more RAM. And you may need multiple devices to test different options, different workflows. But being that the physical device replicates the actual experience, regardless of which way that you are running this install or running this install through your, your workflow, you're going to be recreating it as close as possible, even if it's not the only OS installed. So there's a few ways to, to run this install. Um, there's a command called start OS install that's included within the application of the install macOS.app and contents resources start OS install. And uh, that was added back in, I think, 1011 with El Capitan to automate installs. Uh, but it got a lot more powerful in 1013, which I think it was specifically 1013.4, um, with some additional APFS support and the erase install option. You can do this manually. You can write a script. You can use a script that someone else has written or there are even some apps that have been developed, although due to some changes in how this command works with Big Sur, um, some of those things have been changed because now it prompts for a username and password, which you can pass through in a script, of course, uh, but passing through uh, credentials that are privileged is not generally the best idea, uh, especially if you're going to be sending out a script over some sort of uh, management tool where 
it may be cached locally and then somebody could intercept those. This is a interesting one here, the uh, the APFS snapshots. This is from a uh, a blog that's that's been uh, around for a couple of years now. Um, the post is from I think 2018, and this is from the the blog Mod Titan. I think that's um, Emily. And um, what this does is you go through the process of setting up your new system, and you hit the Control Option Command T at the setup assistant, and then you run the the command for tmutil snapshot to create a snapshot from prior to the actual configuration. And then once you're done testing, you can boot back to recovery and restore from the snapshot using the restore from time machine backup option uh, within the, the recovery OS. And the snapshots only work for 24 hours. So this is really a, a short term thing that you'd have to do and come back to um, if you're working on something over and over again. And there are some cautions for this too. Uh, like some other things, there's there's changes when it comes to newer devices. Um, things with the T2 chip or now an Apple M1, there might be some issues with uh, device encryption or volume ownership, which may cause some issues when it comes to the secure token um, or OS updates. Um, but that may not be important for some of your testing. So if it's not important for your testing, then certainly um, give this a shot and it will you know, give you a pretty quick way to roll back, just like a lot of the others. I think it's good to be aware of the limitations uh, in the APFS snapshots, uh, but consider that it is a pretty useful tool. The next way to do this is um, sort of, there's sort of two ways, I suppose. We're talking about either an APFS volume with a secondary install where you might create another APFS volume, which is gonna share that same, um, that same storage space on your drive. And you can install, in this case, I was gonna create a 1015, I have a 1013, and I have uh, Mac OS 11 Big Sur. There's actually an article from Apple about how to test um, beta versions of OSs on how to create that. But basically, it's just like anything else. You you pop the uh, the new volume on, you boot to that installer, and you assign it to that volume. Um, that does cause potentially some issues with your DEP enrollment if you're doing the same device three or four times. So for good or bad, um, you may need to delete and re-add the same uh, machine in order to make sure that it works. Uh, but this works pretty well. I actually use it for my primary machine so that I can go back to some older, some older test systems um, to make sure that upgrades work correctly. And of course, the coolest one, in my opinion, is now that um, Apple Silicon devices are out, you can do a DFU restore. Uh, and much like an iOS device, it requires some real tricky timing. I actually tried to get myself a good video of me doing it without any assistance. And it is a very difficult thing, in my opinion, to uh, to get it to, to jump into that. Now, the easiest ones are the desktops. If you jump into a a Mac Mini or an iMac, it's pretty simple to uh, to get those in. But any um, any portable machine requires some pressing of key combinations and waiting for just a long enough time. In fact, I think somebody on the Mac Admin Slack posted that there's a segment from a Beastie Boys song that if you follow that exact timing, it works really well, and that's how I've gotten it to work in the past for me. So I just didn't know if I should uh, if I should use the Beastie Boys in the in a presentation, but um, once you get that timing, it's actually a really simple thing. It shows up in DFU. You can right click and restore. You can drag a specific version for the restore, which is actually potentially a really helpful thing when you are looking at tools like Nudge or if you're looking at other tools um, that you want to see how they work on different versions of the OS. You can install any version um, from the IPS, IPSW file and uh, 
as long as you drag it right onto there, it'll install that. And it gives you the option to test what your user will really test. And it's so much faster than running the OS installer. Uh, once it's downloaded, it's a really quick install. Then we can talk about testing packages and scripts. Um, packages and scripts are really uh, kind of the backbone of what I think we end up doing in a lot of the Mac admin world. And I've just a quick quick thing. Don't, don't use your primary machine uh, when you're testing. It's tempting, but preparing a test system is really going to help you uh, in the long run because you don't know what is conflicting on your machine that you might have installed being someone who's working with other administration tools. So you want to try to recreate the user's experience as closely as you can when you're testing. So first, let's talk about what a package is. Uh, it's a file that itself is basically a folder with contents. Uh, specifically, installer packages are what we are talking about, and they take files to be installed in a specific place, and they can run scripts before or after. Uh, this is one of the ways to install software on a Mac, and it's one of the easier ways to distribute software with most of the um, existing MDM um, local agents. Um, some things are a little bit more um, robust and can distribute apps from some of the other ways that are very common, like a DMG with a, a drag and drop, which works really well uh, for an individual user. But that's where some tools are not quite as, uh, as good as others, and you have to maybe repackage that. So let's talk about ways that we might be able to create a test package. Um, you've got white box packages, Jamf Composer, Monkey package, package build, auto package, all of these, and I'm sure many more, um, do essentially the same thing. They build a package, but uh, some people are more comfortable with a command line tool, some with you know, a graphic interface. In either case, you've got a few options. First here, I have um, the white box packages application. And what you get on this one is a few different tabs, just some basic stuff under project, under settings, those are slightly less important. You've got the payload, which is where you drag and drop the files and where they go. You get to control the owner, the group permissions, uh, and those things can be really helpful. Under the scripts tab, you can add some Uh, pre-install or post-install scripts. This particular application will rename and permission those correctly for you. But you also have the ability to have resource files that are attached to that. So those will only um, only go to a temp location, and those, once they're used, will get erased from cache eventually. What's nice about that is that if you're caching a large installer or you're trying to use something that you're modifying the install or a tool that includes uh, a custom installer script with some options, you can bring that right into there without having to you know, cache it somewhere on the drive. I think that that's a really good practice to learn, but um, this tool I think makes it quite easy. It's my preferred app for making packages and because of the way that, that I like the, uh, the interface, um, it's what I use most of the time. Jamf Composer uh, is another tool. It's got a graphic interface. The thing that is most uh, unique and different on this is that it has this snapshot feature um, where you can do monitor file system changes and new and modified and see what another install has done. This is another way that you might want to you might want to message or um, you might might want to test a non-standard install and see where it's installing everything, and that might be a good way to package. Um, but the main thing you have to keep in mind when you're doing these file system changes and snapshots in Composer is make sure that the, the files that um, are being added are useful ones, because this checks for all modified files. Uh, some of them might be cache files, preference files that are unrelated. 
uh, and they might have just happened at the same time. So you need to really be careful with it. Um, but to its credit, it works exactly the same as Whitebox packages with a different interface as far as allowing you to drop files and scripts and manage those things uh, much in the same way. So monkey package is a, a free command line tool to build packages. You actually, this is, I think, a really easy one to do. Um, you create a folder structure and a file with some build information like this plist, but it actually supports several different ways um, to, to, uh, to create that information. And it turns this all into a great installer package, which is really useful. The package build command is the built-in command line tool to create packages from, uh, from the OS. Um, probably the least used that I would, uh, I would touch here, but I, uh, I find that knowing how it works is really important because a lot of the other tools are basically abstractions for how to use this. And the last one to talk about is auto package, which is just a fantastic tool to automate downloading and building packages as needed. It can upload directly to your server, uh, whether your server is a monkey server, whether your server is a Jamf server with a couple of uh, different potential options, at least um, in the realm of Jamf. There's the JSS importer and Jamf upload, which are both plugins to work with. Um, auto package. Now I've got um, auto packager, which is the, the graphic interface for it. Uh, if you're not sure where to start, I personally think that um, looking at auto packager is, is pretty useful. Um, it gives you a pretty nice visual representation of things that need to be updated, of things that are going to be run, what your schedule is going to be. And if you're not really uh, comfortable or, or quick learning when it comes to command line tools, this is a good way to get started. Um, basically, auto package starts with recipes. Those are the bases. You can pick and choose an existing one uh, for any popular application. This screenshot, of course, from the GitHub is looking for Firefox, and there's plenty of those, uh, those packages out there. You can build your own. Um, you can override the packages and add your own options, but it's a really powerful tool and it's great for automation. If you get comfortable with these and you want to test your own, um, you know, you can certainly build a server to manage uh, just downloading and uploading those packages. And that can be a really useful thing. Another tool, although not for actually building packages, um, but in the realm of testing packages uh, that I think is going to be really useful is uh, called suspicious package. This inspects packages that are intended for installers and gives you some really good information. What it is, what it installs, how many scripts it can it does, who it's signed by, and whether there's any security questions that it might pop up. Um, so these are good for anything that you might install. It'll give you some really cool information that's really useful. But at the same time, it helps you learn by looking at existing packages and see what their scripts do, see where their files go. Uh, and that can help you learn an awful lot about how to build a good package to install with. The next thing we're going to talk about is scripting. Um, there's a lot of scripting languages that you can use. Python, Bash, and um, the ZSH, Z Shell, I think are the most common ones you see in the Mac admin world right now. Apple is still shipping Python 2.7 for some reason, although it's been um, deprecated for some time. Uh, you can still install Python 3 as it's part of the Xcode tools, but it's not a default install. Um, and if you are going to be using Python, uh, I would highly uh, suggest that you consider deploying it through a package like the Mac admins Python or relocatable Python uh, and you know what version it is and where it's installed. Uh, Bash and ZSH have a lot of similarities, um, and the ZSH shell is the default in um, Catalina or newer machines, unless you have changed it or upgraded and your existing um, probably Bash is, is still there. But once you have a script, 
uh, and you want to test it, you need to ensure that your permissions are correct and you wanna run it on a test system with the configurations you're trying to test. Uh, this particular script is just one that, um, that runs on a regular basis that checks to see if a user hasn't been logged in and then deletes the inactive users. And one of the things that I learned in, um, I actually posted about this on my blog and I got some, some really good feedback about some things that I could change. And it brought some, some good things to my attention that I think are best practices when you are testing. Um, making sure that you log errors as best as you can so that they come to a log and you can track down what your issues are. And making sure that you consider that if you're asking for a variable and you don't see, you don't have that variable provided, that perhaps you check so that it can be run interactively during testing. Um, Another thing that I learned over the years is that uh, you can put exit zero at the end of your script and it will always seem like it's working fine, uh, but that's not really a good idea. Um, telling it that it, it was positive and that it worked, whether it, uh, it did or did not, is probably not the best way uh, to do any testing or to do any logging of, of what's going on because if you tell it that it, it passed and it failed, that's okay. All right, so the next thing we're going to talk about here is testing profiles. Uh, profiles have a couple different ways that you can install them. Um, you can click to install and approve. You can distribute them with an MDM. And you could use the profiles command, which uh, was removed in Big Sur. Distribution with MDM is the preferred way. Uh, this is going to make sure that they're trusted. And this is going to uh, ensure that they come through the uh, the correct channel. This is actually something I just added here. There's some really great resources like this blog post that just came out, uh, I believe, yesterday, with some information on how you can get keys to set for uh, configuration profiles uh, if they aren't documented anywhere easily. There's a couple of ways you can build profiles. Um, two tools that I've used are Profile Creator and the iMazing Profile Editor. I'm a big fan of, um, of Profile Creator. It lets you easily just create and even sign profiles before you upload them to your MDM. And it comes with templates for loads of different applications and system settings. You basically fill in your information, add the keys that you want, and then a nice thing about this is that it doesn't add any keys that you don't want that are related. Um, one of the things that I've noticed that can happen, especially if you're using Jamf, is if you modify something and you really only want to control one setting, you may unintentionally set all of those settings at the same time uh, that are part of that same uh, that same group. But being able to be more specific, I think, is is a little bit more efficient for me. Uh, the iMazing Profile Editor is another free application that can do the same thing with many of the same options for building profiles, templates for different applications. And then we're going to talk about uh, testing workflows. This is probably the, um, the most important thing to think about when you're trying to figure out how to make things work beyond the testing just on your device, just on that VM that you made. The first thing I always say is you got to make sure you're going to plan, 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 have a good plan. Um, that's the biggest takeaway. Have a separate group for testing um, so that they can test updates. See somebody in a group that you know is willing. They can test updates early. They can test beta software. Um, standardize your test period with a specific, a specific amount of time. Let's say you have a two-week delay before uh, your updates go widely available. Have a plan to collect feedback so that you know what's happening, where it's happening, and get a good idea of if things are working well. If they're not working well, what might be causing some of those things? And the most important thing I feel is that uh, real users are gonna do things that you don't, um, that you won't think of because you're thinking of it the way that you work. That's not how everybody does. So if you can stage things with a real group of users, you can get an accurate depiction of how things work in real uh, in real world scenarios. 
one of the cool things that you probably want to do is test updates in beta before release. So thinking about that in the long term, you want to have real experience, especially when you're talking about major OS updates, uh, going to an upgrade from Catalina to Big Sur. You want to be testing those things in beta, maybe not on your daily driver, but you want to make sure that you're testing them to make an accurate depiction of what your um, what your workflows and what your um, use cases will will feel like. And if you can do that, then you can be aware of issues sooner and you can figure out what needs to be done. I'll leave you with another quote from the Hitchhiker's Guide here. Don't panic. And of course, um, we can open it up for questions. All right, fantastic presentation, Adam. How's my audio? Perfect. Okay, good. Um, it's I good right here. I had an earphone going crazy, so I'm just making sure. Um, so Adam, thank you for taking the time to deliver the second session. Uh, we have a little bit of an issue with the Q&A in Teams. Um, I think they took it away from us because we were using it too much or something, <laughs> but it no longer works at the moment. We're unable to find our Q&A. Uh, so please run over to Slack in the PSU Mac channel and throw in any questions you have there. Um, and we will try to relay them as quickly as we can. Um, uh, I did have one question for you, Adam, to kick it off while we maybe wait for some others to come in. Uh, sure. wh when you when we're using Composer, it has the ability to like have some folders that are exempt from being seen when you're doing these these uh, um, the different installs or the the file system installs and. They seem to be a pretty limited set for obvious reasons. You don't want to miss too many files, but I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you know of any other resources or if there's if there's any one sharing like information on some good ways to reduce that set of that cache. Um, or if, the, if it even makes sense to try and do that, because when you're looking for something that gets installed, does, do you need access to more of the system folders to, to, to kind of understand what you get? Does that make sense? I I personally uh, think sort of the, the second part that you were saying there is, is seeing more and being able to identify it helps you in the long run uh, because you can understand better what's happening. So if you look and you see that it's editing a preference for Finder, but that's not dealing with what you're doing at all, you just know that that happened randomly. But if you can get a good idea of what thing is actually happening, which piece is being modified, um, I would rather have more information and remove it manually. Can you guys enable your cameras? Sure. So we did get a question from the uh, PSU Max Slack, and this comes from uh, Scott Blake. Uh, he's asking, do you have any pointers for how to identify test users? Do you just make an open opt-in system, or do you just cherry pick people? <laughs> I usually have started by cherry picking people because they'll they'll ask me. Um, we definitely have people, especially being in education, we have people in like our computer science department uh, who would like to try things in advance of uh, of them being out, or they want to try things um, when they come out, even if we're not necessarily ready to deploy widely. So I do a little bit of a mix where I start with some of it, where I'm saying, um, this is what I want to do. You've talked to me about this before. Are you interested in trying it? Um, so I usually have a group. And the other part is I, I try to pick people who are possibly already in um, sort of in IT, but not in the same way as I am. Um, so they're not working with the same tools and using the same things that I do. And I think that jumping out to those people um, who have a little bit more familiarity can sometimes be good too. Um, but the main thing is that usually the people who are the best testers are also the ones who are going to ask you about it. Awesome. Um, let's see. How optimistic are you for the potential for automated testing of Mac installers, config changes, scripts, et cetera, similar to the kind of thing GitHub Actions? can do for poll pending poll requests. 
Um, that's a good one. I think that it would be awesome. I'm, I'm trying to look at this here so I can read it. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm not looking at the right screen here. Uh, oh, you're fine. I think it, I think it would be awesome. Um, config changes are one of the things that I've been really um, interested in in reading about lately, uh, and and trying to do like real config management type stuff. But I feel like the way that a lot of Apple's a lot of Apple security practices have been a little bit more restrictive, and I think that it's going to be harder and harder to automate things, um, especially for testing, than it has been in in the past. Yeah, one thing that I've always been interested in that I, I've never seen really deployed anywhere is Sikuli X or Sikuli, um, S-I-K-U-L-I. I'll post a link in the Slack. And um, it's supposed to do graphical user interface kind of automation. And it'd be really interesting to see a library built out of like, maybe you test changing the desktop background or, or accessing the security preferences pane. And then your configuration profiles can make a change and you can run that automation again. Um, but I mean, who knows? It's Python, it's like maybe might be, might be a nice thing to try. I mean, that sounds that sorry. Sounds sorry, like, it's Java. Just, <laughs> that's okay. No, there's a lot of those things are cool. Um, so I see somebody uh, asked about building test VMs uh, in Fusion. Fusion running on the M1 does not currently support uh, Mac OS guests. They pretty much can only run um, Linux and I think uh, I think you can try and run the the Windows ARM build, but okay. Well, we might have lost Adam there. So networking issues, or perhaps that's me. Yeah, we may have lost him. <laughs> 